So right now I have Dr. Kevin Esfeld, who's from the Wies Institute at Harvard University, and he's going to be talking about engineering wild organisms. So I'm guessing not just organisms in a lab, but out in nature as well. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Esfeld. All right. Thank you all for coming today. So I'm going to address this question of not just how we can engineer wild populations of organisms, but also when we should do it and when we should not do it, which is at least as important. So first, a question for all of you. What is the deadliest animal on Earth? Do you know? The mosquito. That's right. The mosquito is the deadliest animal on Earth because it carries diseases that kill more people than any other animal on Earth. Far more than, kills far more people than tigers, than rampaging elephants, than wildebeest, than anything else. Here is a map of where malaria occurs in the world. Malaria is the deadliest mosquito-borne disease. It's concentrated in Africa and a lot in Southeast Asia, to some extent in South America. And the interesting part, though, is where the mosquitoes that carry malaria live, because the map is not the same. These are all the mosquito species that can carry malaria, but you'll note that there are some right where we are. There are mosquitoes outside here that can actually carry malaria, but there's no malaria out there. Why is that? How did we get rid of malaria here? Because we did. There used to, it used to be here. Well, we did it by spraying so much insecticide that we killed all, all the mosquitoes temporarily, and we also used bulldozers to drain all of the swamps that they needed to breed. So we suppressed the mosquito populations for long enough that we were able to drive the malaria parasite locally extinct around here. So you might say, OK, that worked. It's not very environmentally friendly, but it worked. So why won't this work in Africa and Southeast Asia? Well, the problem is that African mosquitoes are extremely efficient at carrying malaria. They prefer to bite people, and so they go from someone who has malaria, and they bite them and get infected blood, and then they go and bite somebody else. Whereas mosquitoes here, they're not as good at picking up malaria when they bite someone. And they also often prefer to bite animals as well. And that doesn't transmit malaria. So the difference in these behaviors is all, of course, encoded in their, the mosquitoes' genomes. So the question then is, can we rewrite the genomes of the African mosquitoes and the Asian mosquitoes that carry malaria to make them less effective carriers? more like the American mosquitoes, then maybe we could get rid of malaria. So how would we do that? Well, we have this amazing new technology called CRISPR genome editing. And it, it works because it's an effectively a pair of DNA scissors that allows us to cut the genome wherever we want. We deliver into the cell pieces of DNA that encode the CRISPR system, which is this Cas9 scissors, and a guide that tells it where to cut. So we put these into the cell, and they go and find the, t the target gene that we want them to cut, and they cut it, and then the cell, in order to fix the damage, will incorporate an altered version of the gene that we've supplied. So using CRISPR, we can edit any gene we want in effectively any organism. It's just absolutely incredible how this has revolutionized biology in the last couple of years. So we've used this to edit the genomes of all of these different species in many, many different ways. And thanks to the efforts of Andy Smidler, an incredible graduate student at the Harvard School of Public Health, we can now add the Anopheles gambiae mosquito that is the main vector of malaria in Africa to the list. So we can now edit the, edit the genome of this mosquito very well with CRISPR. So supposing we do this, suppose we make a transgenic mosquito that we've edited so it can't carry malaria more effectively. What happens if we just release that into the wild? It's going to mate with a wild type mosquito and the offspring are going to either inherit a copy of the altered gene that makes them malaria resistant, or they're not. So when, <clears throat> when organisms reproduce, all of their offspring, on average, get, have a 50% chance of getting any given copy of a gene, because there's two, and you get one or the other. So if we've only edited one, if there's only one copy in the edited mosquito, then only half the offspring are going to get it, and the other half are not. And then when those mosquitoes mate, then again, there's a 50-50 chance of the resistance gene being passed on. And of course, there are a lot more wild mosquitoes out there than there are mosquitoes that we could possibly engineer. So our malaria resistance gene is just going to be diluted out. And even worse, 
whenever we alter an organism, we almost always reduce its ability to survive and reproduce in the wild. So in contrast to our doing something and it somehow being better than what nature can do, in general, we're altering it for our benefit, not for the organism's benefit. And so natural selection is going to weed out all of those traits. And we know that this happens for many, many different organisms. It doesn't matter how we do it. We can use CRISPR to do it. We can use traditional selective breeding. So these, so these turkeys, our domesticated turkeys now, can't actually reproduce on their own. They need our help with artificial insemination. It's not physically possible for them to reproduce anymore. They haven't done it for 50 years. You know, our bulldogs, we've altered them so they have such large heads that they actually need cesarean sections to survive giving birth. They can't give birth naturally anymore. And of course, Holstein cows have to be milked every day because they produce 100 pounds of milk a day. None of these could possibly survive in the wild, and they wouldn't. So the same is true for our malaria-resistant mosquito. Natural selection is going to weed them out. So how can we get around that? Well, here's the trick. What if we actually make the editing step, the CRISPR system, what if we encode that into the mosquito genome so editing can happen again and again? So now we have our altered gene and we have the CRISPR system all on the same piece of DNA. So CRISPR is going to go in and cut the target gene, and it's going to insert our altered gene and the CRISPR system together. Now, the mosquito encodes the CRISPR system, so it's going to continually produce it, and so it's going to cut the other copy of the target gene. And so now you're going to have two copies of the malaria resistance gene and two copies of the CRISPR system. So now when this mosquito mates with a wild-type mosquito, all of the offspring are going to inherit a copy of the malaria resistance and the CRISPR system. And since they encode the CRISPR system, they're going to produce it in their cells, and it's going to cut the wild-type copy they inherited from their other parent. So now the offspring have two copies, which means that when they reproduce again, all of their offspring are also going to inherit a copy. And so in those, editing is going to happen again. In every generation, the CRISPR system is going to convert the original version of the gene to the malaria-resistant version. And so this will propagate on down through the generations until eventually we've converted the entire wild population so that it can't carry malaria. Now, we call this a gene drive because it works by not by changing the fitness of the organism, but instead by changing the odds that it's going to inherit the gene that we want, in this case, for malaria resistance. So you might think this is really clever, but of course evolution was way ahead of us. Nature has been doing this, biasing inheritance in this way, for literally billions of years. And there are natural gene drives in the organisms of pretty much every, or in the genomes of every organism on the planet, including ours, in different forms. Arguably about a third of our genome is broken gene drives that, that reproduce just like this by biasing inheritance. Many of them, employ this exact DNA cutting mechanism. So we're just taking something that nature has already, already developed and we're harnessing it for our own purposes. So there are some limitations to this. It will work for almost any species that has both males and females. So it works again by biasing inheritance. So you have to have inherit half your genes from a mother and half genes from your father. And then the gene drive can bias one or the other, depending on how we program it. It's not going to work in, say, bacteria or viruses that just create direct copies of themselves. There's, nothing, there's no inheritance to cheat. It's reversible. So this is key. If we can build one gene drive that targets a particular gene, then we can build a second one that targets whatever we first put in. So that means we can undo the change made by an earlier gene drive by making another one. It's, a, it's reversible, an undo button which is tremendously important as a safety feature because what if something goes wrong? It takes many generations to affect an entire population. So that is to say, mosquitoes reproduce roughly every few weeks, two to three weeks for most species. But elephants, of course, have an average generation time of 20, 25 years. So if it takes, say, 16 generations for, us to, for it to spread from one copy to 10,000 copies, then that's going to take a couple of years for mosquitoes, but a thousand or so years for elephants. So it really was only going to work on small, fast reproducing things, just like mosquitoes. One of the other things it can do is we know that some of these natural gene drives in the wild do things like bias the population towards males. 
And you can imagine that if you bias the population too far towards males, then there aren't any females to actually reproduce. And so the species can locally go extinct. So you can imagine that we could build a gene drive that could drive a species extinct by biasing it all the way towards males. And there's actually another way that we might do it as well. So that's the list of what we can and cannot do with them as a general summary. How could we use this? Well, we've already covered human health and malaria. So the Anopheles that are the primary carriers of malaria, we could alter them so they can't spread disease. Or, again, there's 450 species of Anopheles. The ones in America are not so bad in terms of they don't carry malaria very effectively. It's really just these couple of species in Africa and Asia that are bad. So if it turns out that we can't engineer them to be resistant to malaria, maybe we should just remove them. Should we? Who should decide that? What about yellow fever? Dengue, chikungunya are all spread by these two species of highly invasive mosquitoes. Um, they're actually now in the, um, in the south of this country. You're starting to see both of these mosquitoes um, are, <coughs> are becoming established, and that's why we're starting to see cases of dengue and chikungunya in Florida, for example. And that's actually, as climate change progresses, it's going to spread further north. So these are, diseases are going to become problems for us as well. Another disease, uh, schistosomiasis. It's this very nasty worm that in infects people. It currently in affects 200 million people and kills on the order of 50,000 people every year. It's not as bad as malaria, but it's still one of the worst diseases on the planet. Should we eradicate this parasite using gene drives? How about closer to home? So how many of you have been bitten by a tick this summer? So presumably you had to go in and get antibiotics to ensure that you didn't get Lyme disease, hopefully. Well, what if we were to alter the ticks so they couldn't transmit Lyme, so you wouldn't have to worry about that? Obviously, it's no fun when a tick bites you, but, it, but it's really the risk of Lyme disease that has us scared. Should we, if we could alter all the ticks so that they couldn't spread Lyme, is that something that you, all of you would support or not? What about conservation? So right now, Hawaii's native birds are going extinct because we introduced invasive populations of mosquitoes that spread bird malaria to them. And every year as it gets warmer, the mosquitoes, which can only thrive in warm temperatures, move higher and higher up the slopes of the volcanoes, which leave the birds less and less ha mosquito-free habitat. And so in 50 years, we're going to lose a dozen or so of Hawaii's native honeycreeper birds unless we do something. And we can't use insecticides because there's too many endangered species of insects on Hawaii, so should we use a gene drive? What about Asian carp, which, are spreading, which have spread entirely through the Mississippi watershed, destroying the ecosystems? It's estimated if they get into the Great Lakes, they're going to do tremendous damage. We could potentially address that with a gene drive, should we? How about cane toads in Australia? We could either suppress their populations directly, or the reason why they're a problem is that they produce these toxins. So the native Australian predators just can't eat them. What if we were to just break the toxin production in all the toads, so then nature could restore, could restore the balance? And of course, the most dangerous invasive species worldwide, except for arguably us, is the black rat. And when it comes to environmental destruction, uh, the rat is pretty much unparalleled, especially on islands. Should we use gene drives to remove populations of black rats from islands and, and other areas where they're invasive? We might now be able to do this. What about agriculture and pest control? We might be able to undo pesticide and herbicide resistance in weeds where it, that's becoming more and more of a problem. We might be able to replace our current broadly toxic pesticides and herbicides with compounds that are only toxic to a particular pest species that we've altered with a gene drive. So it wouldn't affect anything else. We might even be able to alter the pest to simply ignore our crops. Or eventually, we might even, instead of changing the ability of mosquitoes and ticks to spread disease, what if we just engineered them so they didn't like the smell and taste of us? We let nature be and just ignore us when it's going to have cause a problem. That's probably the most elegant solution down the road. Really, what this amounts to is a new way of using biology to interact with nature rather than these incredibly toxic pesticides and bulldozers that we use to drain the swamps, which are much less environmentally friendly. But at the same time, you know, let's not mince words here. What we're talking about is genetically modifying wild populations en masse, deliberately. Should we do it? This is going to be the defining question that we as a society face, and we have no precedent for doing this, because this is a technology that can be used. It's a one-shot. 
So thankfully, that makes it a terrible business model. So ideally, this will be kept completely nonprofit, but it's still a technology that can be developed by a single laboratory and released on their own, in principle, without consulting anyone else, that would affect the shared environment. How are we going to decide whether, when, and how we should do this? To what species? How? How are we all going to be certain that we've run enough safeguards and, and tests? Right now, the model that we all use to develop technologies is primarily scientists develop them in laboratories with very little input from the public. Eventually, they get turned into a product and sent to the regulators. And the regulators say, yes, this is safe, or no, it's not. And then it goes on the market. And then the only vote consumers get is, do they buy it or not? Well, this isn't something that's going to go through the market. You let it loose, and it's going to spread. It doesn't care about international borders. It doesn't care about the marketplace. It's going to spread through the wild population until, until there's no more unaltered mosquitoes in this case. Who gets to decide whether we should do this for any individual case? So I personally would say that this is the perfect example of a technology that needs to be community guided from the beginning. That is, it's meaningless to talk about engaging the public in science if science is still going to develop the product first and then say, so what do you think? Well, at that point, we've invested all of these resources, and scientists have their careers at stake on this, and companies have poured a lot of money into it, and that's a sunken cost. And of course, you've then set up a dichotomy wherein people are invested in you saying yes, and all of us saying yes. Wouldn't it be better to address this problem from the beginning? To say, hey, we're thinking about building a gene drive that would, say, alter ticks so they can no longer carry Lyme disease. Here are the genes we're thinking of targeting. Here is everything we know about them. Here is our experimental plan for what we want to do. And we're going to put all of this online, and we're going to build a platform for the community to talk about it and say, should we, should we proceed with this? What are the pros and cons? Tell us, what, tell us what you hope will happen with this. Tell us what you want to see in terms of how, in terms of how we're interacting with you and what, we're ask, what questions you're asking. And you tell us, what are you nervous about? What's the worst horror story that you can come up with? And then we will work together to design experiments that can ensure that those things don't happen. It would be, in many ways, a replacement for the current regulatory system that says, where, wherein we trust regulators to decide, is this safe or not? Because it would be community-guided and fully transparent from the outset of the technology development. So that's what we're hoping to build. And I hope that together, we might be able to come up with answers to these questions of whether, when, and how we should or should not. Because saying no and accepting that no is as critical as anything else. We should alter wild populations. So I have thanks to many, many people, um, both at Harvard Medical School and the School of Public Health, on developing gene drives theory and experiment. A um, bunch of people at MIT were invaluable in, in uh, bringing me up to speed on the issues with regulation and existing models of community guidance and bioethics. And of course, thanks to Charles Darwin, without whom none of this would be possible. <laughs>